This is the British fleet at the turn of the century. Not only beautiful, but quite an overwhelming display at the 1897 Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. This event was also known as the Spithead Naval Review, and was a family reunion of sorts for the British fleet. Queen Victoria is celebrating the 60th anniversary of her coronation, herself being the first British monarch to achieve such a lengthy reign. She's invited royals and nobles from two dozen nations to be present at the event. Even her grandson, the Kaiser of Germany, was present to view the spectacle. This professional and elegant display could not be interrupted. Everything had to be perfect. But among this organization and famous British orderliness, in barged Charles Parsons' little speed demon, the Turbinia. Entirely uninvited and sporting a new Parsons steam turbine, Turbinia raced in between warships and ocean liners, splashing passerbys and creating general havoc. She did so in front of the Prince of Wales, who was future king, in addition to the Lords of Admiralty and a bunch of foreign dignitaries. A British Navy picket boat did its best to catch up to Turbinia, but was almost swamped in her wake. Steamship Turbinia. Quite a stupid name for a ship. And yet here she is today at a museum, sitting there like a little pageant girl. Turbinia was a game changer, because despite being only slightly larger than a Canadian basketball court, she packed an intense 34 knots because of her Parsons steam turbine. Then she had to go and show off at the Spithead Naval Review, for some big shots in the transportation industry to turn their heads and say a collective, damn. Despite breaking several protocols and Turbinia's little display, Charles Parsons achieved what he was trying to do. Turbinia had a lasting impact on the nautical world. Now don't forget about Turbinia, we'll get back to her later. Now, in the same year as the Spithead Navy Review, 1897, the clowns at North German Lloyd Line dropped their liner, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, a four-funnel ship that drew all attention towards German shipping lines and away from Great Britain. She was not only enormous, but incredibly fast and incredibly luxurious, and she quickly won the transatlantic speed record called the Blue Ribbon. White Star's luxurious RMS Oceanic two years later would turn all eyes back to Britain, but the Germans came back in 1900 with the SS Deutschland, which took back the Blue Ribbon for Germany. This game of back and forth was getting expensive. Actually, it had been expensive for a very long time. So much so that Britain's leading oceanic passenger transport company, the White Star Line, decided not to play, leaving the British Cunard Line to chase the speed record for the next few years. At this point, Britain's ego was under threat. Brits today love to brag and bash other countries, but back then, at least they had the guns, colonies, and economy to back them up. In those days, Britain's greatest enemy, well, I mean one of their greatest enemies, was Germany, which was building a fleet of epic proportions. So was America, and France, and Italy, and Russia, and Japan. Basically, Britain had to compete in an intense market, and they had a strong will to come out on top. This was all interrupted when some guys in South Africa started getting a bit rowdy. I couldn't make heads or tails of it, but basically the Boer Wars began to take shape. In the heat of the conflict, Britain saw how effective ocean liners were as troop transport ships, and the British Admiralty began to ponder their other potentials in times of war. Cunard Line was going to take advantage of this curiosity and came to them with a proposal. What if the Admiralty were to fund the construction of a few ocean liners for Cunard, and they could be requisitioned later to become warships if the Admiralty needed them? Cunard would get some cheap, high-quality ocean liners, the Admiralty would get minor reassurance, Britain's merchant fleet would reclaim the top spot on the Atlantic, and Germany would get a view of Britain's social finger from their oceanic rivals. The British government was intrigued to say the least. Historically, the Admiralty's main concern was ensuring the British fleet could rival any potential enemy in size. Cunard's proposal seemed all the more appealing in 1902, when White Star Line was bought out by J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company, an American-owned transportation monopoly. This means the British Admiralty probably has less ships at their disposal to requisition. So, the same year, Cunard struck a deal with the British government to build two superliners with government loans. These would be paid off with interest over 20 years, roughly 2.6 million pounds. In the incredibly likely scenario the British Empire ends up at war with another great power, like, say, Germany, the government reserves the right to seize both ships and convert them into ships of war, armed merchant cruisers. This kills two birds with one stone, allowing the British transportation industry to have the fastest ships and allowing the Navy to have two additional ships in their fleet if necessary. Cunard was eager to begin work, and on August 18, 1904, keel number 735, as it was called, was first laid down. Both her and her sister were designed by Cunard legend Leonard Peskett. Initial designs utilized traditional reciprocating engines, but that was up in the air early on, meaning the forward end of the ship was framed and built up first, allowing flexibility with whatever the engine room needed to accommodate. 
Framing finished in February of 1906, and she was launched on the 20th of September that same year, two months after her sister. She also had a name now, RMS Mauritania, named after an ancient Roman province, not the questionably governed island nation. Her sister was similarly named Lusitania, a Roman province in… Uh, somewhere in Europe. And both ships were given lovely nicknames, Lucy and Mori. Some might find this affectionate, but if anything, this confirms to me that people have been lusting after ships for centuries. Mauritania's interior design was handled by architect Harold Pito, and favored darker tones compared to James Miller, the interior designer of Lusitania, who implemented lots of white and bright colors. Lucy and Mori were on the same route and had similar appearances externally, but their distinct interiors created a unique flavor for passengers traveling on either ship. More on that later. Now, the Turbinia. The Parsons steam turbine had piqued the interest of numerous investors. Mauritania needed to be able to go around 25 knots as required in her mail contract with the British government, which was incredibly fast for a ship at the time. They were beginning to think the standard reciprocating engine wouldn't be able to pull it off, even with her sleek hull. Charles Parsons had been building turbines mostly for use on warships up to this point, the HMS Dreadnought most notably. Mauritania would require one significantly larger, one with 68,000 shaft horsepower. The largest one at this point had only been 41,000 for the Invincible class, but the Admiralty really wanted to try the new tech out on an ocean liner, even if Cunard was skeptical. Cunard did not trust the technology, and certainly not if it was to be applied on an untested scale. The Admiralty firmly reminded Cunard that they were funding the ship, and Cunard politely created a committee to review the possibilities of the turbine's use. The committee reviewed a turbine-driven ferry boat, the Brighton, and her reciprocating engine-driven sister, the Arendelle. Brighton was obviously faster, and the committee concluded they should at least give Parsons' steam turbine a shot. Lord Inverclyde wasn't going to go all in willy-nilly, though. He was smarter than that. So he asked John Brown to put a steam turbine on the yet-to-be-completed RMS Carmania to see if the engine could handle a larger vessel. The engine performed beautifully, so Cunard greenlit the Parsons steam turbine to power all four propellers of their newest class of ships. Mauritania's trials were done in complete secrecy in case the new technology faltered, preventing an embarrassing, well, we tried, from Cunard. It was so secret, in fact, that the Marconi wireless operators couldn't send messages from the ship while she was on her trials. Instead, and this is true, they used carrier pigeons to inform the builders of any progress. On her trial on the St. Abbs Head Mile, a popular spot for trial runs, Mauritania averaged 25.8 knots, meeting the required knottage and then some. She was returned to her berth on September 20th, a year after her launch, her trials having been a complete success. 78 years later, on the very same day, Stevie Wonder's music was unbanned from the airwaves in South Africa. This was entirely unrelated, I just thought it was interesting. And if you can't tell, I'm sick of talking about engines. When it comes to a ship, speed is important, but if my guidance counselor taught me anything, it's that what really matters is on the inside. In the case of Lusitania, that would be seawater. As stated previously, Mauritania's interiors were handled by Harold Petto. Much of the first-class interiors were fancified by W. Turner Lord & Co. of London, with the lounge and library built by C. Millier, Millier? Mellier? and Company. Meanwhile, Robinson and Company got the short end of the stick building the children's room and a few staterooms. 28 different types of wood were used all over the ship, probably as a result of hiring three companies. Most of it was Edwardian, yet all of the furniture and tapestries were handmade. Supposedly, all of the wood carving was done by 300 workers from Palestine, but Wikipedia calls this unlikely. I just find it funny that Wikipedia thinks it's reliable enough to declare things unlikely. First-class accommodations stretched over five decks, and one of the most unique locations on board was the two-story first-class dining room, built of straw-colored oak in the somehow different Francis I style. Much like every other ship of the era, it was all topped off with a giant dome. This one in particular was enormous and was creamed with gold lacing. Now, what's a little cool about Mauritania is that the dining saloon didn't have the standard long tables like a cafeteria. It had small tables seating 5 to 14 people on the lower level and 2 to 6 on the smaller upper level. Heading aft, we come to the Veranda Cafe located on the boat deck. This allowed passengers to hang out in the open air if they so desired. This was a feature almost every subsequent ocean liner mimicked. Even if the cafe was covered and included a dome, it had to be fully enclosed within a year. The veranda had lighter colors than most of the first-class locations on board. Now another cool feature was two elevators, which the grand staircase wrapped around. And much like a child surviving yellow fever, that was unheard of in 1907. Now as for the staircase itself, it was walnut and fancy enough for the times. The first class library slash writing room was located behind the second funnel on the boat deck and featured sycamore paneling stained a silver gray. A travel brochure describes the room better than I could. 
The carved moldings are gilt in the lounge, but the gold used has a slightly greenish tint to harmonize with the paneling. A bookcase forms the paneling of one side of the central portion of the room, the delicate carving and gilt trellis of the doors greatly enhancing the wall's appearance. It had a red carpet and a marble fireplace with a giant mirror to see your 1907 face covered in smoker lines. Further aft, we have the lounge and music room between the third and fourth funnels. The room was expansive and featured tons of pillars and pilasters made of mahogany. There were six marble pillars, too, at the end of the room. Traveling through a small hall at the aft end, we find the smoking room, located right behind the fourth funnel. Although it was mostly walnut, all the panels featured an inlaid border of sycamore. The fireplace in there was pretty cool, and its sides were lined with massive slabs of verticamp and marble. It had a giant barn-like roof that was curved around with a giant fancy skylight. The last place, other than the staterooms, worth noting is the observation deck located on the promenade deck, which overlooked the bow of the ship. Now as for the first-class staterooms, you're in for a treat. There were two regal suites on either side of the promenade deck, and included a drawing room, dining room, two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a private hallway. The special and in-suite rooms were pretty nice too, featuring cream-covered wood and some ornamental wood paneling. The rest of the first-class staterooms were pretty lovely, providing actual beds instead of just berths. That same brochure from earlier briefly described them. The mahogany furniture of the staterooms forms a pleasing contrast to the paneling. The floors are covered with crimson Brussels carpet, the sofas are upholstered with pink or red tapestry, the door curtains are crimson, and the window curtains are in cream chalice, chalice chilies, with a floral design on the edge. First class could accommodate 563 passengers. The first class also featured a gymnasium, botanical garden, and photographer's darkroom, but you don't really care about that. Second class was situated in the aft end of the superstructure, which on Mauritania was actually referred to as an island because it was mostly separate from the forward superstructure. Shipyard workers fitted out most of second class, but it was still quite a spectacle. Some articles describe second class as comparable to first class in comfort and inferior only in luxury. Generally, I'd agree with that. All things considered, I think comfort on board these ships only increases the further they get from England. The second class grand entrance and grand staircase were all lined with teak wood and featured a lot more white coloring than first class, although much of second class was really just a scaled down first. Take for instance the dining saloon, which had a giant octagonal dome 19 feet off the floor in line with the grand entryway on the level above. This dome was not a skylight and had some light fixtures all around it. The floor was laid with parquetry, which I had to Google what that means, basically different types of colors of wood arranged in a pattern. It went well with the oak paneling around the dining saloon and gave a little more texture to the room as a whole. Other areas of the saloon had green rugs in between tables, and all of the revolving chairs had fabric of the same color. The second class drawing room was quite lovely, with a dome skylight and a cute maple piano. The Louis... The Louis XVI style ornamental paneling looked pretty nice, with crimson fabric on chairs and sofas. It would look a lot nicer, however, if there weren't two enormous pillars in the way housing ventilation equipment. But what's more important than fresh air? Your nicotine fix. The smoking room was aft of the grand entrance on the promenade deck, and was late Georgian in style. It featured a hell of a lot of mahogany inlaid with English boxwood. The room also had another glass dome. The second class lounge was on the boat deck, and featured the third and final skylight of second class. It was very cozy, and this particular travel brochure states it's where the grand staircase is terminated. The room was mostly teak wood to match the staircase, and through some vestibules, which I had to Google those too, passengers had access to the open air boat deck. Second class cabins were spread throughout the shelter deck, main deck, and upper deck, each room accommodating two or four people. Each stateroom had white paneling and mahogany furniture, and had berths instead of standard beds, but you get what you get. Now, although the turbine engines vibrated significantly less than triple expansion engines, their vibrations still proved to be a major issue for Mauritania, especially for second-class passengers who were all housed in the stern of the ship. Mauritania could accommodate 464 second-class passengers. Third class was actually all right for a ship of 1907. Third class passengers were situated in the forward end of the ship with two main staircases, a dining saloon, a smoking room, and a ladies' sitting room. The dining saloon actually had ash paneling with teak moldings, which is unheard of by this point, and even a piano. The smoking room and ladies' sitting room were on the shelter deck, both similar in appearance to the dining saloon. Third class actually kind of had their own promenade, too, on either side of the shelter deck, which was pretty special for the time. Third class cabins could accommodate two, four, or six people, and were fairly bare bones. A little before World War I, a third class ticket cost about 17 bucks, which is about $511 today. There isn't much to say about third class, they were the immigrant class, and there's even less info about steerage. That's because most info is just advertisements talking about how sanitary steerage on board Mauritania is, not to mention the great ventilation they're getting. So all I can grab really is Mauritania's steerage was cleaner than most ships of the time.
Now here briefly, I'll teach you how to tell Mauritania apart from Lusitania. Lusitania used these distinct hinge top ventilators, while Mauritania used cowl ventilators. This is by far the easiest way to tell them apart. If that's not good enough for you, Mauritania's bridge hung off the observation deck a little bit while Lusitania comfortably rested on top of it. They also had some differences in their skylights, mostly attributed to their different interior designs. Both Lusitania and Mauritania's original design only had three funnels. However, although the Parsons steam turbine in theory used less steam, they needed another funnel to, well, you know what a funnel does. Ultimately, they needed extra boilers to get those turbines running at their best. With everything situated, Mauritania and Lusitania were finally ready to begin their individually long and uneventful careers. On the cool evening of November 6, 1907, Mauritania departed Liverpool on her maiden voyage, sent off by a crowd of 50,000 adoring fans. Soon after leaving Queenstown, I'll call it Cobe for my Finian fans to feel more comfortable, straight off west into a westerly gale. This storm ruined any chance of her winning the speed record, but she still made pretty decent time, a testament to her speed. She arrived in New York with some bent railings and broken windows, and it's disappointing the storm prevented any records from being set, but it gave her a good reputation for reliability. She won the eastbound blue ribbon on her voyage back to England, with a time of 4 days, 22 hours, and 29 minutes. Most of her crossings would see Mauritania battling Lusitania over the speed record. Mauritania would get a significant advantage in February of 1909, because after losing a propeller blade from scraping something underwater, she was fitted with two four-bladed saber propellers on her outboard shafts. This would give Mauritania a speed boost over Lusitania's traditional three-bladed propellers, and her remaining two propellers would later be replaced too. In September of 1909, Mauritania achieved the westbound crossing once and for all ending the sibling rivalry and achieving an average speed of 26 knots, on this voyage that is. Mauritania would make a total of 88 crossings without a hitch. That was until December of 1911, when she broke loose from her mooring and drifted into the River Mersey, sustaining enough damage to have to cancel her apparently famous speedy Christmas voyage, forcing Lusitania to pick up the slack in her place. 1911 wasn't a great year for Mauritania. The stupid RMS Olympic took all the attention away from her by stealing the title of largest ship in the world. White Star once again had to take attention away from Mauritania when she left on an eastbound crossing the same day the Titanic departed her maiden voyage. Following the RMS clickbait sinking, Cunard's chairman organized a memorial service on board Mauritania. In July of 1913, King George V and his wife Queen Mary were given a tour of the Mauritania. Yes, that Queen Mary. This gave her some pretty sweet publicity, although personally I couldn't care less about the royal family. Early 1914 saw one of her gas cylinders explode, killing four and injuring six. Her turbine wasn't affected significantly, but she still had to be repaired in dry dock. Now, I love the dry dock pictures of Mauritania because you get to see the actual scale of her hull, not only relative to her superstructure, but also just her surroundings. May of 1914 sees a new Cunard superliner take to the seas, the RMS Aquitania. Despite being their running mate, Aquitania was significantly larger than Maury or her sister. Mauritania was in the middle of the Atlantic when Britain declared war on Germany, and dashed to Nova Scotia for safety. I don't blame them, personally I'd rather be at the bottom of the Atlantic than back in England. It wasn't long until the government requisitioned Mauritania, Lusitania, and Aquitania, all for military service. Alright, so, remember the whole armed merchant cruiser thing? Well, turns out they kind of suck. Actually, they really suck. Their fuel consumption is ridiculous, their size makes them unwieldy, and although you can mount guns on their decks, it's not like large armaments can be put on these ocean liners. Oh, but they sure can try, and try they did, and not with great success. Mauritania didn't even make it to conversion. Only about two weeks after the war started on August 11th, the Admiralty sighed and allowed Mauritania and Lusitania to continue service. It didn't really matter though, there wasn't exactly a huge market for oceanic travel when merchant ships were dropping like flies. Mauritania remained laid up while Lusitania continued passenger service. Until, well, you know. Mauritania was going to take her place, but that idea was scrapped because that was a really bad idea. So instead, the government opted to turn her into a troop ship for the Gallipoli campaign. We all know how that went, don't need to dwell on it, the Allies really screwed the pooch. Mauritania was painted dark grey with black funnels, and her fancier interiors for the most part were removed and placed in storage while she was stuffed with bunks. Mauritania was either really fast or really lucky, because she managed to avoid the fate of many of her contemporaries, including the hospital ship Britannic. Speaking of which, Mauritania's short stint as a troop ship wasn't going anywhere, so after nearly being hit by a torpedo, the Admiralty made her a hospital ship and painted her white with green crosses and a big green stripe. This was the internationally recognized coloring for a hospital ship. I mean, at least she'd be safe in this role. Well, I mean, she would be if the Krauts had any regard for war regulations. 
Mauritania would move over 6,000 wounded soldiers from the Dardanelles to Southampton over three voyages. She would serve in this capacity until late 1916, when she'd be taken in to once again return as a troop ship. They think they've got it down this time, though. Mauritania was taken in by the Canadian government to carry their soldiers over to support the war effort. I know, I was unaware Canadians could fight too. On the earliest of these troop voyages, a bunch of serious leaks in Mauritania's hull flooded her boiler room and nearly caused her to founder. Mauritania was laid up on the River Clyde through all of 1917 before finally going back to troop transport. Mauritania was given a unique dazzle camouflage pattern, and then a second more famous one with lots of checkerboard design that actually looks really dope, instant album cover material. They also mounted 6-inch guns on her deck, which they intended to do years ago. Life on board Mauritania while she was a troop carrier wasn't really great, but all things considered, it could have been worse. Troops were provided the equivalent of third-class meals, which were hearty and probably better than the rations they were used to. Like I said, they just crammed bunks anywhere, so it was probably a bit claustrophobic in places. Maury made seven troop crossings before November of 1918, and took soldiers home after the war until May. Afterwards, over the next 10 months, she was refitted for passenger service and returned to Cunard. She began her first post-war voyage on March 6, 1920. With an average speed of 21 knots on this voyage, it was clear that Mauritania had peaked and probably would never return to her former glory, much like you two today. She really hit a low when she averaged 17.8 knots on one of her crossings. Things were not looking great. What else could go wrong? Well, that. A massive fire broke out on Mauritania while she was docked in Southampton on July 25, 1921. The damage to her first class was so substantial, Cunard decided to keep her out until March of the following year. In the meantime, Cunard also gave Mauritania oil-burning engines, replacing her coal-burning ones, which meant the lengthy coaling process wouldn't slow her down. Somehow, this overhaul allowed her to return to a 25-knot average again. She went from incredible to disappointing back to incredible again, but I still don't have much hope for you too. After taking her first cruise to the Mediterranean, she was once again taken in to repair her engines, but it had to be finished in Cherbourg due to labor strikes. After these repairs were completed, Mauritania continued doing transatlantic crossings with little to no incident. Prohibition helped her gain more passengers because of her booze on board. Voyages in the 1920s were fairly popular on Mauritania, but American legislation limiting immigration meant she slowly carried more and more vacationers. In theory, this meant her accommodations would have to keep up with the more modern ships, but she didn't really struggle with that. The thing is, cruises grew especially popular in the 1920s, and as time went on, more and more Cunard ships found themselves taking leisure voyages just to make a profit. Mauritania would still mostly function as an ocean liner, though. Unfortunately, in July of 1929, the SS Bremen stole the Blue Ribbon from Mauritania after two decades of holding the record. Mauritania couldn't do much better than 27 knots, cementing Bremen's place as number one. However, in the early 1930s, Mauritania supposedly achieved 30.1 knots on a cruise. Speaking of cruises, Mauritania was slowly doing more and more trips from New York to the West Indies, even in the Depression. She was painted white and was nicknamed the Wedding Cake by her crew. Her age was still an issue, though. And despite these cruises seeing some success for Cunard during the Depression, her accommodations were just too out of date for modern passengers. She made her final crossing in September of 1934, before finally being laid up in Southampton. In 1935, her interiors were stripped and auctioned off. And on July 1st, 1935, the wedding cake left on her final voyage from Southampton to be broken up in Rosef. This sucks. Cunard was a little sad about it, but evidently didn't lose much sleep over the matter, naming another ship Mauritania only a few years later. So what did we learn? Well, rivalries can take you far, but there will always be someone better than you. Being the best doesn't really matter that much though, because with true talent, you'll always be remembered by somebody smart enough to see how wonderful you really are. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.